Community 8, a series of in-depth interviews on the important issues facing the northern New England community in the 1980s, presented each week at this time by the WMTW TV8 News Department. Welcome to Community 8. I'm Peter Weil. A 1985 report on poverty in Maine indicated that uh, in the next uh, uh, 10 years or so, the number of poor people in the state would increase by over 10,000. Now, this comes at a time when federal budget cuts are putting severe pressures on human services programs in Maine and around the country. Today, we're going to take a step beyond the statistics to give you some insights into poverty in Maine and in Cumberland County and what's being done to help the poor through agencies like PROP, the People's Regional Opportunity Program. But first, a quick look at the problem we're talking about. TV8's Ted Canova recently filed this report on the poor in Portland and Lewiston. Let's take a look at it. It was zero degrees on this winter night in Lewiston, and only the unfortunate were in sight. Last night it was much warmer, and the streets of Portland were filled with the poor and forgotten. Well, I'm bitter because uh, I'm a bright person, and I have a loving heart with a Christian background, and I came to Portland uh, naive. Elizabeth is one of the lucky ones. She has a home and gives others a place to sleep. At 65, she's been in Portland for six years, but she still dreams of a better life. And I live paranoid because of uh, the system, social services. In Portland, you don't have to look too far to see poverty at its worst. When you see a homeless person, what goes through your mind? Maybe a woman with shopping carts or a man with no money. But these people are often abused, often beaten, and they have no place to go. Roland Gay says he's lived on these streets since 1947. What's it like living out here? I'll tell you, for any poor guy, we found two or three guys a year ago out here, here in the street, dead, frozen death. It's no fun being out here. Roland gets money and disability, but it doesn't last very long. Some food and beer is his menu. I don't have to worry about the next day. I'll let, the, I'll let God in heaven take care of that. He's my boss. I'm just thanking for him. Let me, uh, let me live, live every day. I could have been dead long ago. And for Roland Gay, it'll be another night sleeping in the woods and wondering what's for breakfast tomorrow. Ted Canova, TV8 News in Portland. Now I'd like you to meet our guests on Community 8, Jack Smith, who's Director of Housing and Energy for PROP, the People's Regional Opportunity Program, and Linda Johnson, South Portland, who's past president of PROP's Board of Directors. Welcome both of you to Community 8. Jack, let me begin with you. What proportion of Maine's population would you say falls into the category of the poor, falls below the poverty line? Well, at any given time, approximately 20% uh, of the population would be defined as low income or uh, below the poverty line of 125% of poverty. Uh, that 20% is pretty deceptive, though, because a lot of times, uh, at any point over the time, people fall in and out of poverty. So it could be anywhere 30% of the population in a year, probably. But the numbers fall. are increasing, according as to the study. As far as we can tell. More and more Mainers. Yes. Are, are falling below the poverty line or people are coming into the state who are already poor? These are people falling into, into poverty mm -hmm. uh, or are unable to get out of it. Now, the, I understand a large number of those people are women, uh, homemakers who's, who, are, uh, who become poor because the breadwinner, the husband, uh, either leaves the family or dies or in some way does not any longer provide well, that income. Statistically, the more women are, that's the greatest growing population in terms of poverty is women and children. And uh, that is true. Uh, any sort of family disruption or divorce or anything like that is, is affected the numbers and increased them. Definitely mm -hmm. increased Do, them. Does the statistic of roughly 20% hold true for Cumberland County as well? We always think of Southern Maine as being so wealthy. Actually, Cumberland County is probably doesn't have as many people at the very, very low income, but has a, probably a higher percentage of people that are near poverty, that are just barely around the guidelines. Uh, we would estimate probably around a third of the population 
is within 150 percent of what the poverty guidelines are, and that's probably for a family of four, an average, uh, an income of around $12,000 a year for the family. Now, when people think of poverty, when they think of poor people, they probably think of the types of people that Ted Canova was interviewing, these street people. Those are the people you see, the bag ladies and the, and the guys sitting on the benches in downtown Portland. Uh, are they typical of poverty in Maine? I, I don't believe, I don't, it's really hard to find a typical yeah. a person. It, it's, it's such a variety. It could be the elderly, it could be uh, the homeless people we were talking about, the street people. It could be women, working mothers. It's, it's everybody. I mean, it's possible that anybody can fall into uh, the way their life situation would turn out that they could fall into poverty. It affects everybody. Can I, can I add, yeah. though, that, that I think we're finding more and more that people in the poverty range often are two breadwinner, two wage earner families where they're both working in the service mm -hmm. sector and earning a minimum wage. Um, they're working in fast both, food franchises that's right, exactly. or in stores. Mm -hmm. Both the husband and wife can be working full time, earning minimum wage, uh, have two or three children, and be very, very poor. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this studies that we've done just recently that the service industry and the retail industry, if you take the leading occupations in each of those uh, service, mm -hmm. those uh, trades, that most of the jobs, if the people work full time, uh, they would be right around what the poverty guidelines are mm -hmm. for just about every single occupation. That's your clerks, that's your security people, security guards, uh, nurses, aides, those types of occupations, that it's practically impossible for those people to uh, get out of poverty, working well, full time. This is especially interested because they say that Maine's economy is shifting around to a service-based mm -hmm. economy from the old manufacturing mm -hmm. days. Uh, and a lot of people are beginning to worry about that because mm -hmm. service jobs are poor paying jobs. Mm -hmm. Those are also the jobs without, without benefits too. There's no retirement plan, there's no medical insurance for those families. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be more part time and a lot more seasonal, a lot more layoffs involved. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's one of the major problems. Mm -hmm. right well, there. right now our economy is doing fairly well. I mean, Portland uh, has an unemployment rate of about 3%. Maine overall mm -hmm. has about 5%. Um, and yet a, a, a good number of people who have jobs still fall into that uh, category. And, and uh, so that, that really is a problem. It's very discouraging, I, I believe, for people the American dream that if you work you're going to be out of poverty. You don't have to worry about it. It doesn't hold anymore, at least in our society here in Maine or uh, across this country. Now, I've always heard that Maine's poverty is by and large rural poverty, people living out in the country, generation after generation of people living in poverty. Does that still hold true? I, uh, you know, I the think beans the, of Egypt, Maine. Yeah, the, we see it as you drive through the country. I think the examples are, are more touching, more disturbing a lot of times. So it probably seems that way, but it's, it's through, I, I don't, statistically, it's probably weighted a little bit more heavily rural than it is in the urban, suburban mm -hmm. areas, but I, it's not that significant a difference, I don't believe. Tell me about PROC, <coughs> People's Regional Opportunity Program, certainly one of the biggest mm -hmm. uh, uh, poverty agencies in the state of Maine. We're a community action agency, and there are 12 of them across the state, uh, pretty much divided up according to county boundaries. Uh, we all run very similar types of programs, uh, fuel assistance, the weatherization program, generally we'll have Head Start programs and daycare, uh, the WIC program, which is a nutritional program for women and uh, small children, we will have that type of program. Uh, every quarter we have a surplus commodities program where we distribute uh, the cheese, sort of giveaway. cheese giveaway yeah. program. That has a lot of uh, press coverage, news coverage. Uh, we have a senior meals program that provides meals to elderly people. Uh, I, those are the, the major programs that we would... All right, you're really dealing in nuts and bolts mm -hmm. assistance. You're helping people right. with heating oil, with food. <laughs> uh, you know, you're, you're not handing out money. You're right. We, the, degree of assistance that people get is going to vary from program to program. But to give you an idea, the service population that PROP handles is 160,000 people in Cumberland County. Each year, approximately 25,000 people are going to receive some sort of assistance from PROP. And that's fairly substantial, I think, in a booming economy that we do have. What, what kind of eligibility do people have to have to get your help? Generally, it's uh, poverty guidelines or just slightly above it, it would be How's for that a family, that's determined by the federal government and uh, it's different measures that they use to determine what 
housing costs would be, food costs, and what it would cost to have a minimal subsistence level for a family. For one person, generally the income will be around, I believe it's around $5,500 a year. For two people, $6,700, three, around seventy-five, eight thousand, dollars and a little over $10,000 for a family of four. And uh, some of our programs are slightly above that in terms of the income guidelines. But, but roughly $10,000 a year for a family of four is considered the poverty line. Yes. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because maybe 20 50 to 30 years ago, that would have been a lot of money, mm -hmm. $10,000 mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. would have, and, and, uh, and of course, in many parts of the world, it still is. But in this country, I mean, if you just sit down and start mm -hmm. trying to figure out a little bit how you, your spouse and two children could get along on $10,000 mm -hmm. a year, it mm -hmm. would be pretty difficult without some kind of assistance. Mm -hmm. One of the major problems, I mean, obviously, is housing costs in Cumberland County and throughout the state are, are really high for a lot of people. And it's, it used to be the standard thing that a, a third of your income would go to housing. Uh, it's impractical with the housing costs for most people today. In Portland, In insurance. Portland. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I would say most of Southern Maine, it's that way right now. And I can't really speak for the rest of the state. What are people doing now? How are, they, how are they coping with that? I'm, look at the newspapers. The apartments are going for $600 or more for a mm -hmm. double. What are it's, people doing? It's, it's unbelievable. I, I, at times, I can't understand how individual families can do it based on the resources you, that you know they're ha they have to live on. They have to cut back, live so tight that, so tightly that it's, it's beyond comprehension, I believe. Uh, there's, something is lacking, I mean, in, some, in how they're spending their money. They're not spending on everything they should. And I think medical care, for instance, would be an optional type thing mm. sometimes, or a, a very basic food diets that there, people are living on. Uh, energy, I mean, you, you live fairly uncomfortably in Maine. The uh, high cost of fuel, co fuel, you probably keep your house at a temperature of maybe 60 degrees year round, which is unbelievable for a lot of people, elderly people. Mm. So uh, they're really giving up what a lot of people would consider essentials. Right. Just to have just, just a roof. to get by. Mm -hmm. mm. President Reagan recently said, "There's no hunger in America. Uh, there's just people mm. who don't know where to go to get help or to get food." Mm. Do you agree with that? No. Is no. there enough food to go around? Just people who don't know where to get it. There's one sense in which what he said has some some validity to it. Um, there are soup kitchens. Um, Probably you could get a meal a day in Portland if you had no money at all, and you could feed yourself somehow. Mm -hmm. The gentleman that you showed <clears throat> at the beginning said he doesn't know where he's going to have his breakfast. Um, he will find a place to have his breakfast. Um, whether you can call that ki any kind of a quality existence is really the question. Um, why do we ask people to live on soup kitchen meals? day after day. The people who are going to those facilities aren't just people living by themselves, they're families. Mothers are bringing their children for their one good meal a day. So in a sense, what President Reagan was saying, uh, if you look at just the bare bones of what he said, there's some truth to mm -hmm. it. Uh, but there's no quality to it, that type of life. And these are people who are living in a very impoverished existence. Does Prop work with the soup kitchens too? At times, yes, we've mm -hmm. actually won soup kitchens in Portland have closed down for a month every summer. We've been taking over the program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are uh, very closely involved in that. PROP is very concerned with the underlying problems of homelessness um, and people who don't have enough food to eat. PROP is trying to get at the base of those problems and solve it from that direction. There are other agencies which do the soup kitchens and um, sharing canned goods and that, that type of thing. But, uh, but through education, through the Head Start program and daycare, the Women, Infants, and Children program, all kinds of other ways, PROP is trying to address those questions. Mm -hmm. And I would say that probably one of the things you're discovering, if you're looking at the root causes of poverty in, in Maine and probably around the rest of the country, are some of the shifts that are going on uh, within our society within the family itself. I'd wager that a lot of the problem is simply caused by the breakup of the family as a, as a unit. That's exactly right. Um, 
I, I've been working with the Policy Council, which is the mothers and fathers of Head Start children and daycare children. Um, many, many of those women are single. Mm -hmm. uh, very seldom do you find an intact family um, represented in that body. Uh, these women are trying to, they've had to move home with their parents. Mm -hmm. And here they think of themselves as adult women, they have children, and yet they're still living at home. And that tears at them inside. They, because you always feel like a child when you've gone back to live at home, uh, even when you aren't. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, that's it, what you're saying is precisely true. Is there hunger on the streets of Portland? You said there are soup kitchens, but is there hunger? Are, are, are children in Portland malnourished? Do you see children in the, in the cheese lines, for example, that are malnourished or that show the medical signs of malnutrition? I really could I don't comment know. on that. Well, I'm, really not, I'm sure. not sure. I really don't know either. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the person that Ted Canova interviewed at the top of the program mm -hmm. said that last winter two or three people froze to death on the streets mm -hmm. of Portland. Is that true? Oh, that's exactly true. It and is people it, s sleeping out mm -hmm. under mm -hmm. the bridge or under wherever. Under the bridge. Yeah. Under the bridge. That's right. And he was talking about being out in the woods, which is probably more sheltered. Um, we have hundreds of people sleeping out at night year-round. Um, because we have shelters, we have places to go, but we have more people than we have beds on any one given night. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are people who are, have grown up and lived always in Portland. Uh, South Portland people who go hungry and have no place to go go into Portland at night. So it's not just Portland's problem, it's, a, it's an area-wide problem. I recall hearing uh, a statistic recently that was also uh, a cause for some concern, and that is that the, the, uh, the people uh, arriving in Portland and, and at the soup kitchens and at the shelters and, and at PROP and, and looking for help are younger all the time mm -hmm. now. I would, you know, just in my observations, I would agree yeah. with that. It just seems mm -hmm. to be that. Maybe there's just less uh, social stigma attached to it now that more people will be involved. But They're attracted like by the low unemployment rate. <laughs> They read that Portland has an unemployment rate between 3 and 4 percent, so they come here looking for jobs. Um, and many times they find them, but they're still not making a living. There's an organization called the Cumberland County Training Resource Center, which gets government funds to help people who are dislocated in their jobs. For instance, if I were fired from my position and I needed to find another type of job, um, they would help me mm -hmm. acquire those skills. But the interesting thing to me is that the funds are not there for people with no skills whatsoever. It's not a matter of retraining them. It's a matter of them having very marginal uh, abilities in the first place. These are the people who, have as we say, fall through the crack. Uh, there's nothing for those people. Mm -hmm. And they are arriving in Portland also, expecting to find a job and they have not the wherewithal to find those. All right. We have just been taking a, a look at the nature of the problem of, of poverty in Maine, in Portland, and Cumberland County. We're going to take a break at this point, and then we'll be back and hopefully come up with some solutions to those problems. Stay with us. Oh, Dad, all these cars and trucks have a $600 cash back from the factory? $600 cash back on every Thunderbird, Cougar, Standard Shift, Tempo, Topaz, Ranger, F-150, F-250, 350, and Bronco 2s. There's even cash rebates on Mustangs, Capris, Escorts, and Lynx. And no money down. Get a free Jolly John mask at three Jolly John locations. I'm not jolly unless you're happy. <laughs> and I'm not happy unless you're jolly. The new WJBQ, your oldies channel. Move to WJBQ AM 1590 with the best hits of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The oldies channel, AM 1590 WJBQ. Portland's first AM stereo with morning fun and the news, weather, and sports you need. The oldies channel, Portland's most exciting personalities, your favorites from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The oldies channel, the new WJBQ AM 1590. The topic is poverty. Our guests are from PROP, the People's Regional Opportunity Program, Jack Smith and Linda Johnson. And PROP recently played host to a major national conference on poverty. 
with a number of high-powered guests and a number of workshops. I want to just take you back a few weeks to that conference with uh, TV8 News reporter Patricia Lee reporting. Let's take a look at that. These young faces show the challenge before society, how to prevent children from growing up poor, or at least how to help them overcome poverty. Many of these children are with Head Start, a preschool program for low-income kids. The children's gathering kicked off the start of the conference on poverty. Conference sponsors say Head Start has been one solution for helping the poor, but more needs to be done. Poverty simply is, in most cases, is simply unrealized human potential. And we want people to realize that we can invest in that human potential and that we can, we can create a new future for all of us. That's why these booths sprouted up at the Portland Expo Center. It's all part of this week-long conference to look at ways to help the poor with more humanity and not necessarily with handouts. Roberta McKeel came by to get some information. She's a single mother of three on welfare. I'm on housing right now in South Paul, but I still, I would like to be able to get my own home and get a job and, you know, have things go better for us. There was a hitch at the conference. There were several workshops held to help the poor help themselves. And the problem with some of the workshops, no one came to them. Conference sponsors say this lack of attendance underscores the problems of the poor. It may be as simple as transportation and daycare problems. Free literature and workshops aren't the only part of the conference. Forums on daycare and illiteracy are also being held. And while this event may not come up with all the lasting answers for helping the poor, at least it's a start. Patricia Lee, TV8 News, Portland. All right, and we're hoping that we can uh, carry that start uh, maybe one or two steps further by, with our discussion today. First half of the program, we, uh, we uh, talked a lot about the problem, that uh, poverty is on the increase in Maine, that more and more young people seem to be falling below the poverty line, that more and more women and children are falling below the poverty line. And um, one of the answers to this seems to be getting education started earlier, getting kids into the Head Start program and, and, and helping children who may now be uh, living poor learn their way out of poverty. Is that correct? Is that, is that one of the answers mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. that we're looking at right now? Head Start started 21 years ago and it was one of the beginning pro programs in the uh, Model Cities program, the War on Poverty that Lyndon Johnson started. Mm -hmm. um, the conference that we held recently was started as a celebration. It was going to be of the 20th anniversary of Head Start and the CAP agencies, of which People's Regional Opportunity is one. Uh, Head Start is perhaps the most successful component to come out of that war on poverty. Um, there has been a very good follow through done on the students as they've progressed through their teen years and beyond now because this is 21 years later and those first, first students are now 25 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a measurable dis difference between their lives and the lives of uh, peers who did not go through Head Start program. And what made the difference uh, with the Head Start program? It was, it was uh, uh, preparing them mm -hmm. uh, for regular school life the way middle class kids are prepared in their families. That's it, exactly right. Um, they learned social skills by being um, in a group with an authority figure as a teacher who uh, was very kind, uh, very gentle with them. They learned their colors, their numbers, their shapes, all of the things that they might not have learned in their homes, which other, other children just get to kindergarten and they already know those things. Uh, these students didn't have to catch up the first couple of years mm -hmm. of school. One of the things that really helps the Head Start program, though, is the intense involvement of the parents, that right. the, the strong belief that the parents are the primary educators of the children. And uh, there's a lot of effort to try and educate parents on how to be proper parents, and this carries over for years and years. And I think that's one of the major uh, strengths of the Head Start mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. It is. In, in fact, in order to have your child participate in Head Start, you need to participate as a parent. What else is needed? What are some other ways to break the the, uh, the poverty mm -hmm. uh, trend. How about daycare? It mm -hmm. seems to me that that would be a, that would make a lot That's of sense. A, if you, you've got, you know, you've got parents uh, that need to get out and, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and earn some money. Uh, they can't do it if they have to take care of kids. Right, in view of the fact that 
it takes two incomes generally to stay yeah. ahead in this society. Uh, daycare is essential. And in terms of single parents with children, it's, there's no other mm -hmm. way that people can work without it. Mm -hmm. uh, as a part of the conference, there was a uh, workshop sponsored by the uh, Chamber of Commerce, Greater Portland Chamber of Commerce, that directly tried to deal with this and had a fairly good turnout and uh, used models of examples of uh, different attempts by businesses to have daycare programs mm -hmm. uh, sponsored. Day mm -hmm. There's programs. very little of that going mm -hmm. right. right. Union Mutual is mm -hmm. probably the only exactly. major employer mm -hmm. in, in southern Maine that's doing this now that I know of anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was very important for businesses to learn that it was in their interest as well as in the interest of the labor force itself mm -hmm. to uh, even band together several businesses together mm -hmm. to provide daycare opportunities for their employees. What else? Any other specific programs you, you think could help right now, could really make a difference? Well, I think PROP has, has tried to emphasize more self-help types of programs where people are involved in their own assistance. And I think people need successes. And as they're involved and they accomplish things, that they can use these successes to apply them to different parts of their own lives. And I think that's, in terms of breaking barriers of uh, poverty, I think that's extremely important. People need successes. And we have to, as a social service agency or society, has to enable people to have these successes. And uh, it pays off. It's such a much better investment. How is our society in terms of its uh, perception and, and, and concern mm -hmm. for its poor? How, you know, what, generalizing now, but what would you say about our society? Well, we, we were talking about food stamps, I mean, food programs. I think there's such a stigma to, for people to have food stamps if you just go through a supermarket line and you pull out a batch of food stamps, uh, I think there's a real stigma attached to that. People are really reluctant to apply for food stamps. Uh, that's an example. That, how do you feel about the TV cameras showing up when you're <coughs> handing out the cheese there at the Portland Expo? Uh, is it's, that good or bad? It's, uh, what, I think I'm, we're we're trying to bring out that this is the way it is, that people need this type of assistance. Uh, that's a very difficult one for us to deal with at times. Yeah whether it's a good or a bad situation. I mean, we're... I mean, I, I'll argue from the media point of view mm -hmm. and say it's important that people see mm -hmm. how many people, how many of their neighbors mm -hmm. need assistance. That it, they, people simply have to realize that there are poor people mm -hmm. who need help and, and, and for no other reason than, than to uh, sensitize them to the problem. Well, I think we pro you should probably emphasize the positive things. I was talking about self-help, the successes in people's lives. I think those should be stressed equally. Uh, equally mm -hmm. and uh, that's and a lot of times in the media that isn't done from Maine to the world.